committee meeting Wednesday, February 15th, 2023 at 7.04 p.m. I'll call the meeting to order. Please note that we are live streaming on our YouTube channel and recording will be available on our YouTube channel afterwards. I will ask you in a moment to please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and I will invite you to remain standing as we take a moment of silence for the passing of two wonderfully dedicated people of the BR family, whom both lost their courageous battles with cancer. Miss Shannon Davis, an English teacher at the high school, and Mr. Dan Ellis, a, cons a custodian at Bridgewater Middle School. So if you join me for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, I would like to introduce our school committee members and administration in attendance this evening. On my left, I have Mr. Marino, Mrs. Martelli, Mrs. Conrad Labarento, Mr. Powers, the acting superintendent. On my right, I have Emerson Kills, Kilsby, the co-chair of the Student Advisory Council, Mrs. King, Mr. Fitzgibbons, Mr. Dolan, Mr. Marrera, the vice chair, and I am Lillian Holbrook, the chair. We also have in attendance this evening, um, okay. uh, Mr. Michael Schantz. Is that no? <laughs> no, he is not. Sorry about that. Miss Judy, oh, there she is over there. <laughs> Miss Babalola, um, our business manager, and Mrs. Judy McDougall, our recording secretary. We also have with us other members of the admin team and Mr. Matt Tucker from BTV. Okay, we are returning from executive session with one um, item of business where I will entertain a motion to approve the release of the executive session minutes of August 24th, 2022, and October 3rd, 2022. So we'll second. We have a motion by Mr. Marrera, second by Mr. Fitzgibbons. This will be a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Marrera? Aye. Mrs. Martelli? Aye. Mrs. King? Aye. Mr. Fitzgibbons? Aye. Mr. Dolan? Mr. Diamarino? Aye. Mrs. Conrad Labarento? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. We have nothing else to report at this time. Next on the agenda, we have public comment. The school committee welcomes information, concerns, and opinions from those attending the meeting in order to give those wishing an opportunity to speak, ensure compliance with open meeting law and other legal obligations, and avoid disruption of the meeting. The committee will not engage with the speaker or with one another in deliberation on comments as they are presented during public uh, comment periods. At its discretion, the committee may schedule issues raised by a speaker for deliberation at a future meeting. If you would like a personal response, please email the committee or Mr. Powers directly following the meeting. The chair will now open the public comment for a period of 12 minutes per policy BEDH and would ask anyone who wishes to speak to please approach the podium, provide your name and address, and respectfully ask that you please limit your comments to three minutes. When your three minutes are up and you still have not finished, I will ask that you submit your thoughts or script to our recording secretary, Mrs. McDougall, and she will distribute it to the committee for our review. At this time, I will open public comment. Anyone wishing to address, if you would step forward to the podium. What time am I open at? 7.08. No one? Okay, then we going once, going twice, 
public comment is closed at 7.09. Okay, next on the agenda, we have correspondence and recognition and community emails and correspondences. Each month, I will continue to report on emails and correspondences from members of the school community over the course of the month. This month, the school committee received um, emails on the following topic. An email thanking Acting Superintendent Powers, myself, Mr. Dolan, and Mrs. King for the budget discussion with the Bridgewater Town Council and members of the Bridgewater Finance Committee. That was the only email that I was in receipt of for this month. Mr. Powers, do you have anything you would like to add? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I did receive an email from a parent, and I had the opportunity to forward it along to uh, school committee. Uh, this particular parent was singing uh, Miss Angela Watson's praises. Uh, Miss Watson, as you know, is the high school principal. She's worked very closely with uh, this family. Uh, there's multiple um, students that have come through the district. Some have already graduated. Some are still currently at the high school, and she just wanted to take the opportunity to thank Ms. Watson for all she's done working with her, um, working with her boys and all she's done for the family. Uh, it was quite the email. Uh, a lot of thought and um, consideration went into drafting that email, and so I thought it was important to share it with you and also Ms. Watson. Uh, certainly a very proud email to get. Um, super, uh, you know, proud of Miss Watson. Certainly a difficult situation uh, that this mom spoke about. Um, so I commend her for having the courage to do that and, and being able to get through that. I know it was not an easy email for all of us to, to probably read and get through, uh, but it was a very special, uh, very special email. So just wanted to recognize her. Thank you, Mr. Powers. And yes, it was a very difficult email to read. Um, and that concludes correspondence and recognition. Next on our agenda, um, we have a consent agenda. So uh, this is an action item. And in the consent agenda, we have the approval of the minutes dated December 29th, 2022 and January 25th, 2023. Approval of general ledger warrants dated January 26th, 2023 and February 9th, 2023. The Reeds Collaborative Agreement will become effective July 1st, 2023, and the 2022 and 2023 ESY dates July 11th, 2023 through August 11th, 2023, with a small group of students attending until August 18th, 2023, due to the severity of their disability. So I will now entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Second. We have um, a motion by Mr. Moreira, second by Mrs. King. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Eight in favor. Next on our agenda, we have the edu educational reports and the student advice report. Mrs. King. On Wednesday, February 8, 2023, I attended the Student Advisory Council meeting at the high school before school. Um, I just want to say thank you to the group um, of the Student Advisory Council, Ms. Corelli, their advisor, for having me. Um, we had a short time, um, and it was very icy that morning, um, so we just had a very brief overview of Robert's Rules of Order, um, how our meetings are generally run, and how and when they could ask questions or insert comments. Um, during meeting regarding agenda items or, agen or how to present items that might not be on the agenda, how to add items or to ask questions regarding that. Um, I know we had discussed previously about how to make the Student Advisory Council um, more impactful um, and get them to be more comfortable as part of our meetings. Even though they don't have a vote, they do have a voice on our school committee. Um, and I know that, you know, I discuss with them, like, you know, I have my own personal experiences and what I'm bringing to the committee, but we also want to be mindful of what the students that are actually going through the school system, what their voices, like what their concerns and issues that they want to, you know, approach as well. Um, so hopefully I can make that regular thing and be part of their um, meetings as well. So I just want to thank them for having me and hopefully we can make that a regular thing. Um, and thank you to Ms. Curley for arranging that as well. Um, so with that, I would like to turn this over to the Student Advisory Co-President, Emerson Kilsby first. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, and good evening. So this month is Black History Month, and BR is doing its part in reflecting on influential black people in history and present times. In order to commemorate and better educate students on black people who have been influential in areas including sports, education, science, music, politics, etc., students have been given the opportunity to make Black History Month posters to hang in the halls of BR. Students can get one hour of community service for one poster and can make up to three posters earning a total of three, three hours of community service to go toward their requirement of 15 hours in the school year. And Rachel isn't here tonight, so I will be reading her report. Um, so she is attending a debate competition, so she can't make it, um, but she's reporting on some events that were held at BR for Valentine's Day. So the Decca Club held a fundraiser selling delicious cake pops of various flavors for $3 each which will fund competitions, field trips, and events. A sweet note will be attached to the cake pops and delivered on Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day fundraisers are always lots of fun. In addition, the class of 2025 held a carnation fundraiser. BR students and staff had the opportunity to purchase carnations and a note to be delivered to anyone in the school on Valentine's Day. This was such a kind and sweet fundraising event that brought smiles to many people in the school. I wish you all a, a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you. And next is Rowan. Good evening, everyone. Um, so, you know, I always give my usual TJ squared, but I'm going to move that to next month. I promise there's going to be a month gap. Um, but to this month, I'm going to be talking about Mr. BR. Uh, the show is on the road. During this month and next month, seniors will be actively rehearsing for Mr. BR. This competition features lots of skits, performances, and more. They'll be competing amongst three different categories, swimwear, funwear, talents, and formal wear. The show will take place in the BRHS Auditorium on March 17, 2023 at 7 p.m. See you there. And now, Nolan. Good evening, everyone. With February break coming around the corner, the winter sports season is coming to an end, and BR Sports had an amazing winter season. Our swim team had an outstanding year, ultimately bringing home the Southeastern Conference title. Our wrestling team finished with a competitive end, ultimately beating Plymouth South in their last tournament by merely half of a point, clinching their SEC title with a total of 10 podium places, including two number one spots at the 170 and 182 weight class. Our amazing coaching staff also ended up winning coaching staff of the year. As well, our girls gymnastics team had a dominating season going undefeated, taking home their division title last week. This past Monday, our girls basketball team beat Dartmouth 59 to 31, going undefeated in their Southeastern Conference and winning their division title. Our sports teams had an amazing winter season and now all these teams are looking to take home the ultimate championship as they compete in the state tournament. Come support our teams as they compete during the next few weeks. Uh, so Quinn Daly is not here tonight, so I'll also be reading for him. So even though he cannot be here tonight, he wanted to share information about the GSA Leadership Council meeting that took place last Tuesday, February 7th. GSA stands for Gender Sexual Sexuality Alliance. Several schools were in attendance from King Philip Regional, Canton, Old Rochester Regional, Bridgewater Rainham, and Norton. The meeting took place in the Bridgewater Rainham lecture, lecture hall, where we're in right now, and lasted from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Some topics that were discussed included community building and organization, self-care, setting boundaries, and how to explore support resources. The event was very inclusive, supportive, and fun with there being pizza at the end of the meeting. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And Mrs. King, I wanna thank you also for taking the time to meet with the student advisory um, group to review how they can be um, more active in our meetings and take part in those. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. That concludes their report. Okay, thank you. Next on the agenda, we have um, social emotional learning presentation by Ms. Kendra Rose. So if we could, um, school committee members, take a seat in the audience, that would be wonderful.
Hello and good evening and thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here to provide um, an update on some of the work that I've been involved in um, the past several months. Um, also here to further introduce myself, I'm Kendra Rose. Um, I'm a school psychologist by training, but as you know, um, I've been uh, doing district level work um, since September. Um, I, um, as the social emotional learning department head, um, it's very clear that you as a school committee and for the district have made social emotional learning a priority. Um, so that's very exciting for me to be involved in. Um, so I began this work in September really focusing on uh, resource mapping and conducting some needs assessments across the district, um, which was a, a big undertaking considering the regional nature of the district. So trying to figure out uh, what currently, what current supports we have in place in terms of social emotional learning and mental health. Um, and then where we need to go um, for next steps in the future. So much of my work has been um, focused within the lens of MTSS or multi-tiered system of supports um, and trying to, again, assess what we currently have in district and then figure out what we need to enhance our tiered supports. Um, and uh, it wouldn't really be a presentation without showing you uh, some kind of triangle, if, if you guys are familiar with um, the MTSS framework or an RTI framework. Um, so what we um, are focusing on as a district is making sure that our core curriculum um, that is available to all students is meeting the needs of the majority of students. So that's the, the triangle. Uh, visual that you see there. So green represents uh, tier one supports, which is the core curriculum that everybody gets. And then the yellow and the red are um, the 20% of students who need some more intensive supports. Um, and part of what uh, we're doing <clears throat> together as a social emotional learning department is making sure that we meet the needs of all of our students. Um, so in terms of social emotional learning, the district has adopted um, the Castle Five is a short name for it. This is called the Castle Wheel. And I actually have to apologize. This is a, an older version that's been updated and I'll talk a little bit about what's been updated. Um, so the five sections that you see in the middle are the five overall, overarching skills or competencies. Um, that have been defined by um, the by Castle, which is a, a collaborative of um, researchers and other professionals um, who have determined that these are the five main skills um, involved with social emotional learning, and that includes self awareness, self management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making, and then. Um, this visual has three rings around um, the outside, but the updated version has four rings, which actually separates um, family and community into two separate entities. So a lot of the conversations and work that we've been focused on are enhancing, um, as you'll see, SEL curriculum and instruction. So again, assessing what we currently have and figuring out where to go um, or where we need to go um, for the district. Um, and then with, uh, so that's within the classrooms. And then also making sure that we have school-wide frameworks that support this work, as well as professional development for our staff. Um, and then um, in terms of families, making sure that we are uh, connecting um, with families in a really meaningful way. And then enhancing our community partnerships as well to um, provide um, social emotional learning opportunities within the community as well. Um, so in addition to social emotional learning, um, well a part of that is also behaviors, student behaviors. And so another focus area of the work that we've been doing is um, enhancing 
our positive behavioral intervention and supports or PBIS frameworks within the district. Um, so we have multiple schools who are actively engaged um, or have, have teams that are actively engaged in um, this, uh, the process of implementing this type of framework. Um, and so if, if you see the, the circles, the three circles in the center um, are the three things that we need to focus on in order to gain some positive outcomes. And so some of that is systems, so making sure that we have systems in place um, to manage student behaviors, um, making sure that we're looking at data in a really meaningful way, and then also enhancing our classroom and school-wide practices um, to make sure that we're being proactive and preventative and not just um, punitive um, when it comes to challenging behaviors. Um, there are several objectives within the current student success plan that are related to some of the work that I've been doing. Um, and this helped really early on and, and throughout the year to focus on some priorities. Um, the first one was to identify social emotional learning uh, screeners and curriculum. So that's, that process is definitely well on its way. We're in the planning phase, or, so we're, we're planning um, some pilots of screeners and curriculum. Um, and I hope to have some um, of those pilots underway as soon as this spring. Um, so, so that's going really well. Um, I also created a web, uh, an SEL uh, page on the BR website um, with content for educators, families, um, community resources, and just some foundational learning. So you'll see the castle wheel up there, um, something that hopefully at some point everyone will be well aware of, in, you know, family, staff, and, and everybody. Um, and then uh, the third objective was to continue on with the MTSS academies that are sponsored by DESI. Um, and these have been going very well. We have the PBIS Academy um, that is functioning at the high school, and then the Social Emotional Learning and Mental Health Academy uh, that is um, ongoing and active at Bridgewater Middle School. Um, and those have been really excellent opportunities to um, provide professional development to myself as well as our staff at multiple buildings. Um, but also we receive technical assistance from um, DESE coaches, which is um, just a fantastic opportunity for the district. Um, just a couple of screenshots of the website. Um, I welcome everybody to um, go check it out. If this, if this presentation was sent to you, the, there's, there's a link that brings you directly to it. Um, but it's under, I believe it's under district information, and then there's an SEL page. Um, so on the left, you'll see just some of the, the tabs that kind of explain the, the different sections. So like I said, some foundational learning, um, talking about the SEL uh, components um, and the Castle 5 and the Castle Wheel, um, as well as tools for educators and school staff, tools for families, um, community resources, and then adult SEL is an area that is um, really being focused on um, post-pandemic because we know that you know, the, the pandemic has hit school staff and teachers really hard and we have to make sure that we're taking care of our school staff. So that's another um, area that we're trying to focus on is how can we help <coughs> our teachers take care of themselves. Um, we've also added an SCL section in the BR Buzz that goes out bi-weekly. So um, I keep repeating that word, foundational learning, but it's all part of the process of district-wide SEL implementation is making sure that I'm blasting um, everywhere, everybody with the same language. We all want to have a common language um, so that we all uh, have the same shared understanding and shared agreement of the vision that we, um, that we have for our district. So, um, and then there's also strategies for home and school that I've been trying to incorporate there. And I always include my contact information. I wanna make sure that people, uh, my contact information is of course on the website, but I wanna make sure that people are aware that um, my position exists and that I'm available for consultation or um, any type of communication from 
community members, families, and school staff. Um, in terms of funding, uh, I realized really early on uh, doing this work that uh, we're going to need some money to, <laughs> to implement some of these really uh, good strategies that we have in mind. Um, so uh, the, together with administration, Mr. Tovalos and, and Mr. Powers, um, we wrote a, we applied for a grant, um, the Supporting Student Social Emotional Learning, Behavioral and Mental Health and Wellness Grant through Jesse, um, and we are, were awarded that grant. Um, so that was something that was really exciting for us because it gives us a, a, a pathway to continue on this work. Um, so some of the, the uh, funding will be used for identification and piloting of social emotional screening measures, um, piloting of <coughs> mental health screening, implementation of universal tier one social emotional curriculum, uh, development of building based social emotional data teams to help to gather and analyze some of the data that might come out of the screenings. Um, improvement of the BR in Need program, um, so funding for families in need within the district. Um, social emotional focused professional development for staff, social emotional training for families, um, and then development of um, some visuals that we can uh, post throughout the district in various ways regarding our district-wide SEL framework. We also have um, some active community partnerships um, that are exciting. Um, we work with High Point Treatment Center, who has uh, provided us with uh, currently two counselors who are in three different schools, providing in-person counseling um, to our students. And I put 20 plus students receiving services because at the time that I um, was making this presentation, it was, um, about 23 but since then we've had multiple more referrals um, so we have at least 25 students who are currently in our buildings receiving services and I think that's a really big win it's 25 plus students who um, for a long time have not received services that are much needed um, due to various reasons so um, that partnership is is going um, exceptionally well in my opinion and then I've had multiple students um, reach, I've had a relationship um, as a school psychologist with Bridgewater State University. They've reached out to me in years past about placing interns um, from the psychology department. And so we currently have a bachelor's level psychology intern placed at BMS um, and another intern placed at Mitchell. Um, and really good feedback about um, that partnership as well. It's really helpful for the district um, and helpful for these students to, to gain the opportunity and to get to know our district as well. Um, in terms of professional development, um, there are many, many uh, related to the grant that we applied for, um, but also just related to social emotional learning and mental health. Jesse is sponsoring many, many uh, opportunities for professional development and so I've been trying to take advantage of as much of that as I can um, not to be redundant but we have the PBIS Academy and the SEL uh, mental health academies going on um, we also have a we're taking advantage of a trauma sensitive coaching series um, I'm leading a team at Merrill that's going through that and then we have multiple staff at multiple different schools who are engaging in universal mental health screening professional development right now. That's um, the, that last one, the mental health screening is something that started up more recently, but I was very impressed with the number of staff from varying schools who are interested in engaging in this work. Um, so that's been really nice. And then um, I encourage you to go to um, this has been shared with me um, by m multiple different people, but I encourage you, if you haven't gone, to um, click on the link and go to the Spotlight on SEL and Mental Health um, page um, that Desi has put out, um, just to get an, a sense of all of the opportunities that they are providing to people throughout the state, um, but also to get an idea of what they're priorities are um, and so we've really been I've been sharing um, they have 
fall sessions, winter sessions, and spring sessions, um, which is nice. And I've been sharing all of those sessions out with um, our clinical staff, so our school adjustment counselors and our school psychologists, as well as building and district administration, and really encouraging them to take advantage of these opportunities. Um, and then this is just a list of some other things I could think of um, that I've been involved in. So we've um, started holding monthly meetings with school adjustment counselors, which has been very helpful um, for myself to get to know our clinical staff, but also for them to have some sort of common planning time, which is um, something new um, this year. I already talked about the DESE-sponsored PLCs um, and sharing PD resources. I've been participating in building-based SEL-related teams, so different buildings call them different things, which is actually absolutely fine. Um, some buildings are focused on PBIS, other buildings are focused on trauma-sensitive work, um, other buildings call it safe and supportive um, teams, so no matter what we call it, it's all SEL focused and um, each building is doing some really good work. Um, I've also been consulting and collaborating with Kayla Berrios, the DEI coordinator, and participating in the DEI advisory committee, as well as the health advisory committee with Claire Grennan. Um, I talked about the website, um, supporting clinical staff with outpatient care coordination. So one of the big, um, there's a big barrier right now with matching students with counseling services outside of school. Um, and it's a big deal for us because that's a recommendation that we make when students need more than what we can offer with school-based services. So um, that's been a challenge, but also um, I think a, an important piece of this position is helping our clinical staff in the district navigate some of those barriers. Um, we're always working on updating our community resources list, so making sure that things are current, um, so that we're sending families lists of resources that they can actually um, access. Um, and then coordinating with community partnerships and planning social emotional learning and mental health related PD for um, for next year, for the fall especially, is something that we're beginning to talk about. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments? Um, I'm super excited about the grant. And congratulations to the district, district for putting in the SEL grant and the great staff for the district around resources. I'm just curious, how long is that grant? The, it ends in June, so, so it started in December. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yep. Um, um, oh, and then my other question was, um, is you talked a little bit, there's a lot, it seems like a lot of support going to the guidance counselors and the, um, the school psychologists, whatever. Is there support also, or, and you, you talked about the, the BR buzz, is there, like support around we're going out to teachers and that may be in progress and something that we're working towards again because again they're the first line of defense a lot of times right mm -hmm. in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. Yeah it's um it's a lot of the the grant money uh, a, a lot of that money has been done dedicated or is, is set aside for staff professional development so that's part of what <coughs> we are planning. It's a little bit tricky in that the professional development time in terms of the half days and even the after school meetings, the staff meetings and the professional learning community times, a lot of that has been scheduled out for the year. So I've been inserting myself where need be, doing some presentations at staff meetings, um, sharing resources through email to all staff. Um, but I think where we're really going to see the professional development and especially the grant funds come into play is fall fall professional development, and, and also opportunities over the summer. Um, so that's definitely, that's our next step, is figuring out how best to support our, and get this information out to our teachers. One other question. Some of there's some pilots that are coming. Is it, just for the quality, is, it, is there going to be a pilot inside the district, if that makes sense? Because I'm, right now there's that's a lot the goal. happening on the Bridgewater side. I'll just be transparent. Like at Bridgewater Middle School, there's a lot happening. They've been piloting, doing some really good work. I just wonder, like, when does some of that go over to the mm -hmm. 
I'm working with every school. Um, I can say that every school is in a different place in terms of their readiness for some of these initiatives. Um, and that's part of the importance of the resource mapping and needs assessment. So every school is engaged in some type of action plan with me. So we have steps at every school that we're going to be taking, but it looks differently at every school. So yes, we are piloting on both sides of the district, um, but it, 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 it might look differently. Um, and, and it might look differently from school to school on the Bridgewater side and the right hand side. So yes, both of these pilots are gonna take place on both sides of the district. Yeah. We were definitely mindful of things that we're rolling out, say, from the district level. Some of those NTSS academies, principals have the option of joining or not, depending on their readiness level. Uh, but we've even looked at some of the screeners. So when we are piloting the screeners, we, we're not, we're making sure we're piloting on both sides of the district. Um, some of the school-specific, you know, uh, initiatives that you mentioned are happening, uh, maybe on one side more than the other. But definitely anything that we're looking to roll out a pilot, uh, doing it. And the other thing too is that I kind of, in, in, for lack of a better term, inherited these academies at the schools in which they were, um, uh, uh, the schools that applied or, or the schools that were ongoing. But I can say that both of these academies are so well run and, and, and um, focused and, and strategic that actually I've had conversations with district administration about if we're not able to apply and get other schools involved in these academies, because I think they will be, there's going to be like an open period of, of um, application for next year's academies. If for whatever reason we're not able to continue on with the DESE sponsored academies, I do feel confident that we've gained enough information and skill about how to um, work through these processes that we can replicate that type of PD or experience in other schools in the district. So that's definitely something that we've talked about. Just because this is happening at BMS through DESE right now, there's no reason why we can't start to replicate that at any other school that's interested. Tom, one more question. Oh, go ahead, Kevin. Um, so I heard a lot about the, the, the student social emotional learning. Uh, and I, I heard about the PD for the staff. And I don't know, Laura, if, if this is the road that you started down and maybe I, I misunderstood. Is there support for the staff themselves, not just for PD? Because I know we as a committee talked about this during COVID, and it was a very stressful time for everyone, staff and students. So I didn't know, does this, does this have a, a, an aspect of it that supports the staff as well? Um, I think the biggest piece that I'm involved in is shared learning and shared understanding through professional development, like you said. But there's also an aspect of, um, especially the DESE, the DESE coaching, um, they are encouraging us and building administration to focus on staff wellness. So they have offered, um, their assistance with materials or presentations on staff wellness, um, self-care, making sure that you know we are self-reflecting on staff's own skills um, in terms of SEL strengths and weaknesses that we have as adults and how that might play into <coughs> how we're teaching our students social emotional learning skills. So I think it's, it's a process in place and I have had these conversations with multiple building administrators on how we're going to address staff wellness, um, but there's nothing specifically in place or in the works right now um, that I can speak on, but it is a conversation that's happening um, in buildings and, and when I have these conversations with building administrators. We also have, um, at the high school, one of the school adjustment counselors um, is has has been focusing on staff wellness and what we're going to do to support our teachers. And so she um, developed it's like a February wellness challenge. Um, sent out a calendar of activities that adults can do to take care of themselves. So if, if for February, there's one activity per day. 
And so the building administration sent that calendar out to staff and they're gonna do, you know, sort of make it a little fun activity. There's a raffle involved if staff are able to, um, they can fill out a Google form saying that they've tried new strategies or, uh, and, and let, let us know how it went. So um, I think there's small initiatives like that that we're hoping to then build up. Um, if that helps to answer your question. Yeah, no, but it I, is a focus that, that needs to come come to the, the top of the list. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I, I know we as a committee talked about it during COVID that it, it was stressful for students, it was stressful for teachers, you know, and, and we want our teachers, you know, our students look up to our teachers. We want to make sure that they're in a, a good place and a well place that they can pass that along to their students. So I want to, I just, you know, I know we focus a lot on students too, but at the end of the day, you know, all these students are staring up at a teacher who's leading the class. I want to make sure that we don't lose, you know, uh, you know, hindsight of them as well and focus. Yeah, on them. I'm really glad to hear you say that, and um, it certainly needs to be a priority for all of us. So we'll we'll definitely continue our discussion about setting out a specific action plan to uh, to support our teachers' well-being. Just add to that, Madam Chair, uh, Ms. Rose mentioned working with Ms. Brennan in the Wellness Committee. So that is also something that's been a focus of the Wellness Committee as they. Uh, rewriting the, the, the health and wellness policy under DESE, uh, there is a, a requirement to focus on staff wellness. So that is something that uh, she's working with uh, Mrs. Barry, Ms. Rose, and a few other committee members to focus on that. And I know Ms. Healy, uh, one of her initial charges has already been to start to explore ways in which we can increase staff wellness uh, across the district as well. So it's, it's definitely on the radar, and we, we do have the wheels in motion, but more to come on that. Thank you. Yeah, and if I may, um, I think that staff wellness, it has to start at the top. If they're the ones that are going to be, they're on the front line every day, they're on. And if they're not in a good place, then I think we really need to be starting there because they are the face um, of, of the district, of the children sitting, fr sitting in front of them. And the more support and training we can give them, the wellness that they need um, during these times is really quite important. Um, and I really hope that we get on that sooner rather than later. Absolutely. Anyone else? Just one question. Sorry, is something near and dear professionally, personally? Um, I actually have been on professionally on some of the calls, and I know John Crocker is very well known in the state and leads a lot of this. Um, people don't know he's out in the field in public schools, but leads a lot of this through the state and is recognized nationally, actually. And one of the things that's come up in some of the professionally, and I'm just curious, there's been a lot of talk around, again, supporting, again, thinking about wellness, is school guidance counselors and where they get their supervision. Because a lot of them are counselors, but they report to administrative people and not licensed as a mm -hmm. clinician. And just some of the kids are really complex, and so when you get into some of those clinical supervision issues. And I'm just curious for our own district, and I don't know, for our school guidance counselors, do they report to the school psychologist and are they getting clinical supervision? Or are they going, is it more of an administrative to a principal or to who? There's, I know there's a big conversation in districts across the state. Yeah, exactly. This is a nationwide problem, yeah. a statewide yeah. problem, right? Um, there is no clinical supervision in our district. Um, the evaluators for our clinical staff are either building administrators <coughs> or district administrators. Um, it's a problem that needs to be talked about, but you know, like you're well aware, it's not just a district yeah, problem. Exactly. But so. Myself meeting monthly with the school adjustment counselors, and we meet monthly as a school uh, school psychology staff as well. Tiny step in helping to support that. We do certainly do case consultation. Every single time I meet with them, I make sure, because they're not used to having a, a support available like that, I make sure to let them know um, that that's part of what I'm here for if they need to consult on any specific tricky cases. Um, but it's something for us to think about. Um, it can sometimes feel a little bit alone on, on an island. And um, the other thing that's been brought up is how are we evaluating our, our clinical staff? Are we using the teacher rubric um, from DESE? And so those are some questions that have been recently brought up that certainly we'll continue um, to discuss. Anyone else? 
Okay, so I will entertain a motion to accept the social emotional learning, behavioral and mental health and wellness grant from DESI in the amount of $132,472. So moved. We have a motion by Mr. Moreira, second by Mr. D. Marino. Is um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. And thank you very much, Ms. Rose, for the grant that you worked so hard to get for our students, families, and educators. Um, it really seems like a comprehensive uh, program, and I look forward to an update in the near future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, next on our agenda, we have administrative and school committee uh, reports, and Mr. Powers, a report from the acting superintendent. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the school committee. Um, I am here tonight to provide you a report of the <coughs> superintendent's office. Um, I, I did want to just start, uh, Madam Chair, with your permission. I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, Ms. Sharon Davis and Mr. Dan Ellis. Um, Ms. Davis had worked at the high school for over 20 years uh, in the English language arts department. Um, and, you know, obviously my interaction with her over the last eight years was somewhat limited, uh, you know, when I'd be up here visiting. And I've come to learn uh, quite a bit about her uh, over the last couple weeks and, and just what a special and impressive person uh, she is and was. Um, things you, you know, you, you learn about someone that you never expected. Um, I, I think uh, Mr. Hayhurst shared that uh, she had gone to see uh, the play Annie and also Alice Cooper in the same week at, at one time. Um, she loved adventure, she loved her concerts, um, but you know, most importantly, she loved the kids. And it wasn't just about teaching them uh, what was in the books. It was about teaching them about life and caring for them and, and really taking those extra steps to make sure that all of our students knew that um, they had a special place uh, you know, with her. So I, I just, again, would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that. The other uh, you know, interesting piece of information, uh, she left uh, BR in the afternoons and, and went and worked at the Middleborough Public Library. Uh, in, uh, of course, of all places, the uh, children's section of the library. But she would uh, spend her evenings there. Um, and, and it was something that she loved uh, to do, and uh, it was again, you know, the the tribute by the director of the the public library was uh, quite impressive as well. So, um, if you had the chance to to speak to Sharon, you always walked away a, a better person and, and enlightened, and uh, just always feeling good about yourself. I think again, uh, you know, I had the privilege of working in the same building as Mr. Ellis. Uh, he was the uh, nighttime custodian at uh, what is now the Bridgewater Middle School, but at the Mitchell, the old high school. Um, and he was responsible uh, for a period of time of cleaning central office. So Ms. McDougall and I had the opportunity almost on a nightly basis to interact with him. And again, uh, you know, you would uh, just check in, how's everything going? And then as the weekends approached, you would start to hear stories about his uh, planned adventures. And if you knew Mr. Ellis, you probably couldn't picture uh, him doing this, but he uh, rode a, a four-wheeler, a quad, every weekend, and he would ride it around Rainham, and he would ride it up north in his property up there, and so you always heard those stories about his, his weekends, and um, you know, obviously a, a, another special person of the district. So I, I, again, just wanted to take the opportunity to, to recognize both of them and certainly share our condolences with their uh, families. Uh, we do have uh, you know, some items to report on. Uh, kindergarten registration is about to open. Uh, Ms. Cohan uh, in her department is opening kindergarten registration on March 1st. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't really close kindergarten registration. We have a, a soft closing, as we call it. It'll last uh, right before April vacation. So our, our target is March 1st through April 14th. Again, uh, that's somewhat uh, open-ended. Uh, obviously, opening kindergarten registration this early just helps us to prepare for next year, gives us a better sense of uh, incoming enrollment, and, and uh, you know, uh, so we can make the necessarily uh, necessary changes if if need be. All of that information is on our district website, so we do encourage parents when registration uh, does open up on March 1st to visit up, visit our website. Ms. Uh, Cohen has put a nice big uh, tab right there in the middle of the website. You can't miss it. Um, and it, it outlines all the information that they need uh, to provide in terms of getting their student registered um, you know, for kindergarten. And obviously any student uh, that turns five on or before August 31st, uh, they are eligible to register for kindergarten for the 23-24 school year. So we're, we're excited to start that process. But again, that kindergarten registration will open on uh, March 1st. Um, also, this Friday, we will be sharing with the community 
without parents and guardians, our district and school report cards. As you know, each year the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education uh, releases a report card uh, for the district and for the schools. Again, the timing of those report cards, um, you know, they're, they're not active, so they're not actually reporting on, much like our student report cards of in the moment progress. These report cards are based on uh, last year's achievement data, Obviously some uh, update, uh, updates to enrollment and so forth, so some of that is reflective in, in our October 1. Uh, but obviously, uh, you know, it's, it's great for parents to take a snapshot, see what the district, uh, where the district stands. Uh, I think what they'll find is a lot of the information that we've already shared with families in, in the community back in October. So these report cards are reflective of, of that information that we shared. So those will be shared out through the buzz. The district report card will be shared in the buzz, also posted to the website. And then I know our principals will also be sharing out uh, the school report cards uh, via email to uh, their uh, populations as well. Um, also uh, coming up, e uh, it's that time of year where MCAS is looming. Um, as you know, as we get into uh, the end of March, the MCAS testing window starts. Each individual school will be sending out their, uh, their own testing schedule. Uh, the state puts out a testing window and uh, within that window schools have to develop a testing schedule that works for them given the number of grades, number of classrooms in each school. Uh, so that testing window will open up at the end of March, grades 3 through 8 uh, for ELA it's March 27th through April 28th. Grades 3 through 8 math will be April 24th through May 26th. Grades 5 and 8 science, technology and engineering would be April 25th through May 26th. Grade 10 ELA, uh, grade 10 has a little bit less flexibility in terms of when they schedule. Uh, the state is very prescriptive on the high school testing dates. So grade 10 ELA is scheduled for March 28th and March 29th. Grade 10 math, May 16th and May 17th. And then the high school biology test is scheduled for June 6th and 7th. But again, principals will be sending out additional information in terms of the exact schedule for MCAS for their individual buildings. Um, and that concludes my education reports. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Does anyone from the committee have any questions? Comments? Hey, thank you. Next on the agenda, we have budget subcommittee report. Mr. Dolan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the budget subcommittee met on February 6th at 4.30 p.m. in the superintendent's conference room. Uh, Madam Chair, you were in attendance. Ms. Murray, Ms. King, and myself. Also, Mr. Powers, Ms. Babalola. Mr. Schantz and Ms. McDougall are also there. Um, the first item that came before the committee was an antivirus contract. Mr. Schantz uh, presented a 39-month contract, a three-year, three-month contract for Sophos antivirus software. Uh, the current contract expires in April, which would leave us a three-month gap. Uh, that, that is why we're moving forward with a 39-month contract um, and not a 36-month contract. The software is used for the PCs within the district and not on Chromebooks. Um, Mr. Schantz did price comparable products uh, but received quotes that were uh, more than double the Sophos quote. Um, this contract uh, will be from April 9th, 2023 through July 8th, 2026. So Madam Chair, in the form of a motion to approve a three-year contract uh, with Sophos Antivirus for $47,110 over the life of the three-year contract. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Dolan, second by Mr. Fitzgibbons. Any discussion? Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Fitzgibbons. Just so folks in the audience and listening back at home understand, because of the level of pricing, this doesn't rise to an RFP and having to go through all of that, you get quotes and you Correct. figure out who the best yep. vendor is. Correct. Correct. Did not have it, did not rise to that level. Thank you. Yeah, okay, we have a motion by Mr. Dolan, a second by Mr. Fitzgibbons. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, motion passes. We also received an update uh, from uh, Mr. Kilgore on the windows <coughs> at BMS and the roof at Williams. Uh, Mr. Kilgore is waiting for quotes to be returned uh, for the areas that need repair in those two buildings. Um, the track and tennis court. The engineer was still working on the details for the positioning of the track and the tennis courts at the time of our meeting. Uh, Mr. Powers provided an update on the Mitchell School. The lighting controls and the vendor was on site again this month working on the problem. Uh, apparently, it's coming close. 
being completed. Uh, yes. <laughs> both. We're, we're hoping uh, the technician is back on site this week, so we're hoping to see significant progress by the end of this week. I am not 100% confident it will be resolved by the end of this week, but we do expect to see significant progress by the end of this week. Excellent. Thank you. Um, for FY23, Ms. Valvolola reported that there were no changes to the FY23 budget uh, from the last time the subcommittee met, and as a reminder, as always, um, October 1st, we freeze our budget to get us through the remainder of the year. And then we discussed uh, our FY24 budget presentation. The subcommittee had a lengthy conversation about staffing priorities that Mr. Powers provided to the subcommittee. Um, the subcommittee did ask that Ms. Valola and Mr. Powers provide estimate sheets uh, that have been developed in the past. The subcommittee also requested that Ms. McDougall send invitations to the public hearing to the Bridgewater Town Council and the Brainham Board of Selectmen. As a reminder, the public hearing is scheduled for March 8th of 2023. Uh, we also met on February 13th at 4.30 p.m. in the same place, the superintendent's conference room, um, with the same folks in attendance, uh, Madam Chair, yourself, uh, Mr. Marrera, Ms. Uh, Ms. King, myself, Mr. Powers, Ms. Favarola, Mr. Kilgore, and Ms. McDougall. Uh, and uh, Ms. Robichaud as well was there. Uh, again, Williams, uh, and, I'm sorry, windows at BMS on the roof at Williams. Mr. Kilgore had met with the vendor for the window replacement quote. Uh, the vendor would like to complete the project in sections of the building. Um, Mr. Kilgore believes the quote uh, would be available for our March uh, school committee meeting, so uh, stay tuned for more details there. Uh, the track and tennis court update, um, again, this is from February 13th. Uh, Mr. Powers, Mr. Kilgore, and the track, the high school track coach met with Conoco, um, our engineer, regarding the track. Conoco is recommending a 42-inch lane uh, with two shot put and two discus, discus, discus locations. Sorry. Um, the tennis course placement, placements will not work in the space behind the home bleachers at the high school and the subcommittee looked at other options at the high school. Uh, Mr. Kildor is going back to Conoco with other options and will bring it back to the budget subcommittee in March. Um, there was no update from our February 6th meeting for the Mitchell School, um, and again, no update from the FY23 budget as well. Uh, the FY24 budget presentation, the subcommittee again had another lengthy conversation um, regarding the budget presentation. Uh, we worked on the draft presentation that will be part of the hearing. Um, and again, as a reminder, the hearing is March 8th. Um, also on the agenda was the custodian substitute pay. Uh, Mr. Kilgore brought uh, a request to raise the substitute custodian pay again to the subcommittee. Uh, the subcommittee asked Mr. Kilgore to provide some details of the cost back of backfilling the vacancies um, since his original request failed this committee um, in October. Um, and he will be providing that to us for our March uh, budget meeting. Also on the agenda was the lunch program. Um, I received an email from the Massachusetts Association of Regional Schools informing the membership that the free lunch program has not been funded by the state starting in March. Um, however, they are hopeful that the state will fund it in the coming weeks. Um, with that said, the subcommittee has asked Mr. Powers to investigate the cost of continuing the program here in BR from March to June, and we'll bring that information back to the subcommittee at our next meeting. Madam Chair, I bring that up so parents can plan accordingly um, in the next coming weeks um, and, and don't plan on, uh, we're hopeful, obviously, that this will get funded at the state level, um, but Folks should plan accordingly uh, for that lunch program. Uh, also, Madam Chair, as the final item on other, uh, Ms. Robichaud reported that uh, the money that we returned to the town of Bridgewater as a um, housekeeping matter was returned back to the district um, late last week. Um, so we have that, uh, those funds have been returned to us. And that concludes both of my reports, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dolan.
Next on the agenda is the Bridgewater Town Council meeting on February 7th, 2023. Let, Chair, oh. Can I just, oh, follow I'm sorry. Up just yes. a couple things? Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Board. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Um, we're still holding, and I guess this is for the acting superintendent, we're still holding the contractor on the hook for the lighting bills. We're not paying them. That is correct. That's correct. That's good. Yes, uh, no Thank payment has been issued. Um, just a suggestion. Do, uh, if I could. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Powers, if I could, uh, just to clarify, are you asking about the contractor's bills or the electric bills? The electric bills. Okay. That's, that's different. The electric bills we are paying because we don't want the electricity shut off. Um, so we're, we're paying those bills. The contractor has not been paid. We're withholding payment okay. on them. Um, so just, I just want to make sure we're- No, appreciate it. Apples to apples, not- Thank you. Yep. So. Um, just a suggestion uh, on budget invites, if yep. you could invite the FinComs from each town yep. as well, that would be awesome. And uh, just uh, following up on the lunch program, Contact your state reps and senators. It's in their court to figure it out. So, please do that. <laughs> Thank you. And just a note: um, we still don't have funding numbers yet. So that March eighth, we're holding. Fingers crossed that we will hold that hearing. But if we don't have numbers from the state, we might have to push it off. But we do have deadlines. We have to have. A budget certified by April 29th, so we're kind of under a time crunch, and the numbers that we have are still tentative without numbers from the state for Chapter 79. So, yeah, and just to email I, the state about that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and Madam Chair, just to add to, to that one last thing, uh, not having the funding does trickle down to everything else behind it too, with um, the two types of. Uh, towns we have, Raynham being still a uh, town um, meeting type of government, uh, they have to put that on their spring warrant. They have to have enough time to put on the spring warrant. So hopefully everything, fingers crossed, lines up and we stay on track. If not, we may not make the Raynham town spring warrant in time to um, get everything out to the public. So. And what happens in that case, Mr. Then they would probably end up holding a special <coughs> town meeting. Because we have to give the warrant by March 30th. That's the bylaw date. Mm -hmm. So Five days. we have a bunch of deadlines that we're trying to keep to. Mm -hmm. We'll um, see what happens with the state. Mrs. King and Mr. Dolan. Has there been some acknowledgement by Desi that, you know, because a lot of us have discussed the law about this, right? So, um, and then, like, some, I don't say flexibility, but like some of those dates and those time frames may need to be moved because everybody is waiting on state right. numbers. So, so it's not just districts either. It's, it's towns, towns too, yeah. correct, right. Municipalities are waiting for that state funding as well. And, and there is the law that school districts have to abide by, but then there are local ordinances as well that we have to abide by. So <coughs> all of that has to be looked at. There is, from what I gather, some discussion of holding us harmless if the numbers don't come out. I would think that that would have to come from the governor's office, though, since really that's where we're waiting for the numbers to come from to begin with. Um, so that that's sort of where we're where we're at. So as Mr. Fitzgibbon said, Paul Beat can help. And we don't want to <laughs> Let go them one, know. we don't want to go on a one twelve. No, we budget. don't want to do a one twelve. We did a one twelve budget back in twenty twenty. And that was that was very difficult for us. Um, so we certainly don't want to do that. And there's no indication at this point that we will have to do that. Um, we're hearing that the in the next two weeks we should have our numbers. But again, it's without having them, there's some anxiety all around, not just for VR but also for our our communities as well. So. Yeah. Too. I mean, we don't have our numbers, so we're kind of struggling with hypothetical numbers and trying to set our budget, but the towns don't have their funding numbers either, so they can't tell us if they can even afford assessments. So we're all kind of in a holding pen. <coughs> and to add, Mr. Dolan and Ms. King, if my understanding, <coughs> there is some potential increase in costs, especially out of school, out of district placements. It's yes. going up by like 14%, which that's those rates and those costs are done by OSD and DESI. Yep. 
Um, and so there's some potential increases we, that are unknown to, like we've got to make some. We are, we have budgeted for that those 14% increases. Those increase. increases. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That 14% increase has, was budgeted for by Mr. Powers in his presentation, and we certainly will carry that over because there's no way we can, uh, we can cut that. The state is telling us plan for 14, we are planning for 14 and hoping for less, but again, not driven by us, yeah. Exactly. We can't get driven by hope. <laughs> Hard numbers. This is Dolan. Just uh, you brought up the budget from 2020. I think you said a 112 budget. Yes. Can you just explain to the public what that would entail? Yeah. So a one, sure. Uh, a 112 budget is when our budget hasn't been certified by um, the member towns or hasn't been approved by the member towns. So we basically go month to month. Uh, we get a budget every month. Uh, it's 112. So in July, we get 112th of our budget. In August, we get another 12th of our budget and so on and so on until we get that budget passed from the prior year. Correct. The, yes, <laughs> that's, the, that's the funding. Killer, it, yes, that's, sorry. That's yes, that's a that, <laughs> right. So it's it's the it's the previous year's budget divided over twelve months, and that's what you get. And it makes it very difficult to operate because we're then talking about inflation you, included. Right. There's no inflation included. There's no contractual obligations included in that because, uh, as we know, we have four bargaining units that we have to, and that we've bargained with in good faith, that we will give them a, a cost of living increase, a percentage every year, and then not just the bargaining units, but our independent contracts as well. So it makes it very difficult to operate a school district on one twelfth budget from the year before. So that, that's, thank you for the question, but that's, that's sort of in a nutshell what it is. We're just, we're just praying for the best. In a couple of weeks, we'll have a good budget number. And as a subcommittee, we have ideas of how we're going to meet at least once or twice more before that to just kind of get our numbers down once we get that. So, fingers crossed. Anyone else? Okay. Next is the Bridgewater Town Council meeting on February 7th, 2023. Myself, Mr. Dolan, Mrs. King, Mrs. Conrad Labyrinto. Mr. Powers and Mrs. Babalola uh, attended the annual Bridgewater Joint Town Meeting discussion. And this annual discussion is held per the Bridgewater Charter. And the collaboration between the district and the town is so important. So I would like to thank the town council for inviting us and keeping those lines of communication open. Next on the agenda, we have communication and public relations, Mrs. King. February 1st, 2023, the school committee hosted a DEI professional development workshop um, at the superintendent's conference room. In attendance were school committee members Mrs. Holbrook, Mr. Marrera, Mrs. Conrad Labyrinto, Mr. Dolan, Mrs. Martelli, and myself. Also in attendance was our DEI coordinator, Ms. Barrios. The workshop was run by Mrs. Mindy Paolo of LMP. Um, it was part of a one of a two-part workshop. It was very informative and thought-provoking. She went through a PowerPoint and we had some discussions um, about different things within the district. Um, it was good for us as a school committee, I think, to kind of talk through. We've had these professional developments with our staff um, for the past couple of years. Um, so it's something that we've put a lot of work in with Kayla, um, Ms. Barrios, and um, professional development. Um, to have the district move forward with that work. So I think it was really important that we had the school committee participate in that and see what we're having our staff and our students and our, our district move towards. So we're also on the same page. Um, so I think that was really good for us to go through. Um, so I really think Ms. Barrios for facilitating and putting that together, um, Ms. Paolo for running that as well. Um, I also wanted to, um, this is kind of an announcement, but kind of a little blurb, um, Rohan did not mention it, but I will mention it. <laughs> um, the high school robotics team, TJ Square, has its first competition of the season coming up. It's going to be hosted at the VR High School um, the weekend, the first weekend in March, March 3rd through March 5th. 
Um, that's kind of the first big competition of their robotic season. Um, the matches are going to be held on Saturday with the finals on Sunday. Um, I've been to these competitions before, and it's even if you've never been, it's amazing. Um, bring your families. It's really interesting. The kids <coughs> love it. There's food for sale. It's like an all-day thing. Um, and the pit is open in between matches, so you can go and see the robots up close. Um, you can meet the t different teams. Um, it's a really great atmosphere, and everyone is so excited. It's a great STEM event, too, to get kids. I know my husband was on the high school team when he was here, um, and he loved it. And now our daughter, as a ninth grader, is on the team. Um, it's so amazing to see how much they, the math and the science and the teamwork that they put in. So, and it's a really great event, so I really urge everyone to come out and support the team and to check it out. Um, it's a really great event. So, March 3rd through March 5th. I just wanted to say that I know Rohan will probably talk about it at the next meeting, but I really wanted to, you know, tell people about that so they can attend. So, that concludes my report. Thank you, Mrs. King. Next on our agenda, we have community liaisons, Mr. Fitzgibbons and Mrs. Carmen Labarento. Mrs. Carmen Labarento. Okay. Mr. Fitzgibbons. Um, much like yourself with community correspondence, it was a very light month okay. for me. Um, I did hear from, um, I won't say several, a few people in light of the Michigan State tragedy, tragedy to make sure that we were still doing everything possible on a security front. And, you know, I assured them that we have regular <laughs> meetings with our police departments, et cetera, and uh, everything's as in hand as it can be. Okay, thank you. Next on our agenda, we have the personnel report. Ms. Healy. Good evening, Madam Chair and School Committee. I'm reporting on the dates from 117-2023 through 214-2023. Um, in the past few weeks, we've had six new hires and one rehire, um, three new substitutes, three reassignments, four resignations, one retirement, and the um, two other um, passing of their employees. Next on our agenda, we have new business, appointment of the Title IX coordinator. And the district has a dedicated Title IX coordinator, and the role of this coordinator ensures fair treatment of the school community. Tonight, I will appoint our Director of Human Resources, Mrs. Ms. Nicole Healy, as the Title IX coordinator. She is assigned this role as a newly hired Director of Human Resources. And we do have other people within the district who are also certified. And Mr. Powers, if you could, would you elaborate on that, please? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, in the summer of 2021, uh, our uh, legal counsel, Murphy, Hesse, Toomey, and Lahane, did conduct a training for the administrative team at the time um, around Title IX. Uh, and through that training, our administrative team uh, became, depending on their role, depending on their level, um, trained as either an investigator, a decision maker, um, and uh, at the district level, uh, the coordinator position. So that training did occur during that summer. Um, so each principal, assistant principal, uh, district administrator uh, did go through that training. And again, um, you know, at each site level, uh, depending if a uh, you know, complaint has been brought up, an investiga investigation would happen, a decision would be uh, made, um, or again, if it was at the district level, uh, certainly that could happen. Ms. Cordero and I had been uh, sharing the Title IX uh, responsibilities from the district standpoint, uh, but then obviously at the building level, our principals and assistant principals have come to that training as well. Okay, and is that required or is that above and beyond what is required? Uh, we, we do need to have a district Title IX coordinator. Someone does need mm -hmm. to hold that uh, role. Um, so certainly uh, we wanted to be inclusive and have all of our administrative team go through that just because we know different situations arise uh, in the moment. They want to be able to um, address those situations uh, and realize whether or not it does fall under Title IX um, and, and certainly take the appropriate actions. Uh, so we felt as though it was important to get our entire staff trained, our administrative staff uh, trained during that time. Okay, thank you, Mr. Powers. 
next on the Madam agenda. Madam Chair, oh. I just, yes. if I may, sure. it, it's, a, it's a really vital position these days as the law around it is evolving mm -hmm. so quickly. So thank you for everyone for stepping up. Next, we have the appointment of the Director of Human Resources to the PEC Committee. Tonight, I would like to appoint our Director of Human Resources, Ms. Healy, to the Public Employee Committee. The responsibilities of this committee are to work with the district's employees, retirees, and health insurance providers to obtain health insurance benefits. Mr. Dolan and Mrs. Conrad Labarento also serve on this committee. I would also like to appoint um, Director of Human Resources to the Sick Leave Bank. Um, the responsibilities include, but are not limited, to review and approve and disapprove all staff requests for extended sick leave in conjunction with um, an appointed member from the school committee by the chair. At our April 25th reorganizational meeting, I appointed Mr. Dolan and Ms. Cadero. Um, so as housekeeping item, I am now appointing Ms. Healy as our newly hi hired Director of Human Resources to this position. Next on the agenda, we have the approval of payroll warrants. So I will entertain a motion to approve payroll warrants dated January 26, 2023 and February 9, 2023. Someone. Second. We have a motion by Mrs. King, second by Mr. Fitzgibbons. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, we have six in favor and two abstentions. Motion passes. Okay, tonight we will also have the read, um, the first read of our 2023-2024 school calendar by Mr. Powers. So if you would just um, mind sitting up in the audience again so that Mr. Powers can show us the calendar. <coughs> I think the dates are fine. I, I can walk them through it and we can certainly scroll to it. I know they have uh, copies. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the school committee. I am here tonight to present the first read of the 2023-2024 academic year calendar. Um, as you know, uh, each district is required to prepare an academic calendar each year reflective of both 180 school days and 185 school days. Uh, the reason for that is uh, inclement weather, uh, should we have to cancel any days due to snow. Um, if there are no snow days, we do not have to go the full 185. Um, and if we have six snow days, we have to go 186 days. So it, that is somewhat of an arbitrary number, but as you'll see as we go through this, uh, that is the reason. So I just want to explain to parents, if we do have to cancel school, we do have to make that day up. The only exception is when we uh, have to have uh, a large number of cancelizations and cancelizations and we get into uh, July. Uh, that would be the only uh, change. But hopefully we don't have to worry about that. Um, so starting in August of 23, uh, right now we're tentatively scheduled to have all of our staff return for convocation on Monday, August 28th and then engage in three days of professional development. Uh, as you know, uh, schools and um, are closed for the Labor Day holiday weekend, beginning on Friday uh, the 1st and continuing through Monday the 4th. And then our students in grades one through 12 uh, will return to school on Tuesday, September 5th. And then our preschool and kindergarten students will return on Wednesday, September 6th. Uh, as we move through the months, uh, October, uh, uh, October 4th, uh, is a proposed early release day for the purposes of professional development. Um, as you know, we typically schedule all of our PD days in the beginning of the year, uh, but really want to ensure that anything that we're rolling out to our staff that we're able to consistently go back and revisit and provide additional support. Uh, so you will, know, uh, you will note that I did uh, include some additional early release days for the purposes of professional development this year. 
that is a slight change from last year and and we you know we do understand that sometimes uh, this does create some scheduling conflicts uh, but I we feel as though if we put this out well in advance that families will be able to make arrangements uh, but it is vital time for our staff to be able to engage in professional activities uh, so that's a proposed uh, date there uh, uh, as you know we always have uh, the holiday in October so that will be on the 9th that's a no school day uh, moving to November is another early release day on November 1st uh, really serving two purposes uh, that is also a um, parent teacher conference day an early release day for parent teacher conference day as well as professional development for the high school looking towards the end of November uh, we have a contractual early release day on the 22nd for the Thanksgiving recess and then no school on the 23rd and 24th because of Thanksgiving. Moving into December, we have an early release day for professional development scheduled in the beginning of the month on December 6th. Looking towards the end of the month, we do have a contractual early release day on the 22nd uh, before uh, vacation and um, obviously schools in, will be closed the 25th through January 1st for the December uh, vacation. We do have uh, an additional day off in January, January 15th for Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And then we've also built in two early release days in the month of January, uh, one on the 10th, one on the 31st. Uh, moving ahead to February, uh, we did build in an early release day on February 14th um, as well. And then you can see the following week is February vacation, the 19th through the 23rd. Uh, in March, uh, we do have, we currently have, and we proposed again to have two early release days in March uh, for the purposes of both professional development that would be the March 6th date and then uh, parent teacher conferences at the end of the month March 20th and the way um, Good Friday has fallen uh, we currently have a contractual uh, day off for Good Friday and that falls on the 29th uh, which is early uh, but we will have that Friday off and then moving into April again a proposed early release day the beginning of April on the 10th and then follow that by school vacation the 15th through the 19th. Moving into May, another early release day in the beginning of May, as well as Memorial Day observed at the end of the month on the 27th, so it'll be no school day. And then we move into June. Uh, June 5th would be another early release day. Um, and that would also be the end of preschool and kindergarten. As you know, uh, we've made the decision the last few years to end preschool and kindergarten early for the purposes of screening uh, those incoming students for the following year. Um, uh, that way we can start school on time. Um, and we don't you know, incur significant expenses over the summer conducting those screenings. Uh, so we will end preschool and kindergarten five days uh, early. Uh, but June 5th will be an early release day uh, for professional development, but also the last day for preschool and kindergarten. And then uh, tentatively, June 12th would be the 180th day of school. That is also an early release day. Our last day of school is an early release day. And then building in the five um, potential um, days for, for inclement weather, that would have us getting out on the 20th. Um, I do want to note uh, June 10th, uh, obviously on June 19th, uh, schools and offices would be closed if we are still in session. Uh, so depending on how those makeup days fall, uh, we could be coming back um, on the 20th or even further if we have additional days. But either way, if school is still in session, there will be no school on the 19th of June. That is the uh, proposed calendar as it stands now. Uh, one item I do want to just share, uh, Madam Chair, members of the school committee, um, the statewide testing schedule for MCAS for the 23-24 school year has not been released. Uh, you know the last couple of years we've run into some conflicts just giving the timing of it between the first read and the second read. Um, I would anticipate by the time I come back to you in March for the second read that that MCAS schedule for next year will be released. That may mean we may need to alter this, but I will certainly update the committee at the next meeting. But I did want to just share with you that uh, I may be coming back to uh, change some of these proposed dates just because of MCAS testing.
questions from Mr. Powers, Mrs. Conrad Labyrinth. Or, ask questions. <laughs> or consideration, Mr. Powers. Um, I know there's been more half days added over the years, and I um, fully understand the need for professional development and all the curriculums and everything we've rolled out. I'm supportive of those. I just wonder if there's any consideration, um, especially on February vacation and April vacation, that half day is the Wednesday right before. Is there any possibility to move that to Friday? Um, we can certainly consider it. Um, I mean, I don't know what teachers feel about having their kids a half day before the February the, front, the break. They still do professional development, but it just it's a gift to parents also, right, in some mm -hmm. ways. I didn't know if there's any consideration to move those. Sure, uh, we, we can certainly uh, revisit that and, and see if it's possible. Um, I know trying to coordinate uh, days around vacation sometimes gets, uh, gets tricky. So, uh, but we can certainly revisit that and take in a revisement. Jeff? Yes, Mr. Fitzgibbons. Um, Mr. Powers, <clears throat> is June 5 etched in stone or does that float with the end of school? Um, that's a, a great question, Mr. Fitzgibbon. Uh, depending on uh, the end of school will not necessarily change the early release day, but it may change the end of preschool and kindergarten. Okay. Uh, so we would I, try I to keep that. To sure yes, we keep we that set as an early people, release. People, as you said, give it to them far enough in advance they can make plans yes. and all of a sudden if it changes. Yes. Typically we, we let out preschool and kindergarten five days before the end of uh, the normal school year for students in one through 12. So we would, we would still keep that five days prior. So it may not line up uh, exactly with June 5th or an early release day, uh, but that is, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Anyone Ma else? Madam Chair, if I Yes, could, I, Mr. Dolan. I know we've said it, but it's worth repeating that this is the first read. We do this twice. Correct. So people should not take this and make plans yet. This might change by March. Mm -hmm. They have comments, they're welcomed. <laughs> That's why we have the first three. Um, Mrs. King. Mr. Powers, is this the same number of PD days as last year? I know we did increase it. Um, as you know, um, this year we did have the one in October. Um, we did have one in December. We added an additional one in January. Uh, we've added one in um, April and May, I believe. Uh, so we did add uh, a number of days from this year's calendar. I, I would just ask, again, thinking about those those half days on February and April, just looking at this a little bit more, the same situation happens in October and January before a three-day weekend? Like it's, there's a Wednesday half day, and then if there's any, again, not that all of them, but it just, it's a little give to parents, especially if people are going out of town, if it's a half day versus whatever. So just a thought, I don't know. Mrs. King? Just a comment, and I'm all for professional development because I definitely think like SEL and different curriculum things that we're rolling out, but adding so many extra days, I feel like it's a hardship for parents. I'm a parent and I work from home, so it's not that big of a hardship for me, but the kids are still home early. Um, and if I had younger kids or if I worked out of the house, it's really tough with an increase in half days. So. I just want to be mindful of how many we're adding, so it's even more than once a month in some months, so I don't want to be throwing too many half days on there because for a lot of parents that's a hardship of if they're working, you know. Fair enough, we can look at that again, absolutely. Mr. Powers, along those lines, like what's the average across the state of professional development hours? Like, is there any, any kind of average? I mean, I know it's, I know some districts that are off once a week, half day. Well, right, I was going to say, like you, you, right, you have some that uh, don't have any re early release days for the purposes of professional development. Um, you know, they may have days scattered throughout the year like we do in the beginning of the year. Um, but then there are districts that um, some have uh, every other Wednesday, early release day, every Wednesday. Uh, you know, it, it does vary across the district, I mean, across the state. Is there anything that Dusty says you have to do so much professional development? Uh, no, just that we have to provide uh, professional development, not necessarily in terms of hours. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Thank you. And um, again, to reiterate that this was the first reading of the 2023 2024 school calendar. And um, 
as Mr. Powers stated that our March meeting, the school committee will vote on the approval of the 2023-2024 school calendar. Madam Chair, if I could, I, yes. I didn't comment that I probably should have on the sick leave bank. Um, mm -hmm. When you appointed uh, Ms. Healy to the position, uh, the, the, the committee, I suppose, I just want to make it clear that that sick leave bank is for our um, union members only and not for our um, independent contracts. Um, that is for our BREA members only, so our teachers, those who fall in that contract, and those who fall in the ESP contract. I just want to um, make that clear to folks because I know there was some um, concern as to what the sick leave bank was, and I just want to make sure we're clear that that's what that is. Okay. <coughs> that's contractual. It exists contractual. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dillon. Okay, next on our agenda is public comment. And um, I don't see anyone from the public here. Would that be correct? <laughs> We're all, I mean, you're from the public, but you're all employees <laughs> okay. of the district. You can speak as a member of the public if you okay. are if you're That's right. Um, so we'll just open public comment at 835. Anyone who would like to address the committee, please approach the podium. Okay, seeing none, we will close. Oh, I bet you were. <laughs> we will close public comment at 835. Um, next on the agenda is announcements. And does anyone from the committee have an announcement? Mr. Fitzgibbons. Uh, yeah, just, uh, and I'm sure I speak for the whole school committee on this one. Um, just recognize today was uh, School Resource Officers Day, and we certainly appreciate the hard work the Bridgewater uh, PD and the Rainham PD do for us and in providing us school resources officers. So a big thank you to both of those departments and the school resources officers they've provided over the years. Thank you, Mr. Fitzgibbons. Anyone else? Ms. Martelli? Junior Music Boosters, they have a fundraiser coming up on February 21st um, at Barrett's Ale House. 20% uh, of the meals will go back to the boosters, Junior Boosters, fifth through eighth grade. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Dolan. Uh, the Bridgewater Rainham uh, uh, Educational Foundation is hosting its second annual gala on Saturday. March 18th from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. at Barrett's Old Scotland Links here in Bridgewater. Uh, tickets are $75 for a tape per person or a table of 10 for $700. Uh, the money raised during the event uh, will be used to fund grants for our teachers uh, to apply for. Uh, the event um, includes dinner, live music, along with awarding of the annual grants to those teachers for innovative programs and the awarding of the Judy McDougall Award uh, for excellence to a staff member of the district. Uh, for tickets, please go to uh, Bridgewater Rainham Educational Foundation.com or scan the QR code that's on the flyer um, or join us on our Facebook page uh, where you can scan the QR code to purchase tickets. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I, I have two announcements. Okay. Um, for those that may not know, I or they probably do know because I've been doing this for a long time. I am the uh, program coordinator for the emergency, uh, the community emergency response team over in Raynham. Uh, my counterpart in Bridgewater and I have put together a adult cert class. Uh, we haven't had a, a cert training class in quite some time with COVID, uh, but we've also opened it up to some of the teens here at the high school because we used to have a teen cert class prior to COVID here, and then that kind of went away. Um, but we did have some open seats in the adult class. Uh, so we have uh, sent the flyer over to the principal here at the high school, Ms. Watson, who has shared it with all the high school students. We still have some seats left. The class starts uh, March 6th and runs through May 8th. It's gonna be on every week from 6.30 to 8.30, 6.30 to 9 at the VFW here in Bridgewater over on Orange Street. So that is open to all high school students and their parents if they would like to participate as well. Um, also, I'd like to just to do a quick shout out to the girls' gymnastics team here at BR um, and, um, and West Bridgewater. It's a joint team. 
They uh, swept their uh, conference, the Cranberry League, 8-0. and They even played a couple of non-league games and beat them as well. Um, so they are going to states. Some of, the, some of the team members are going to states this Saturday. And then they will be going on to sectionals uh, the following uh, on the holiday, on Monday. So I wish yeah. them well. And if anybody mm -hmm. would like to go and see them, they will be competing uh, this Saturday and on Monday. Thank you, Mr. Marrero. Anyone else? Okay, if anyone um, on the school committee has anything that they would like to add or to be considered for the agenda for our next meeting, please email either myself or Mrs. McDougall. Um, we want to wish everyone a wonderful winter break and enjoy your time with your family. Um, our next school committee meeting is um, the FY24 budget public hearing on Wednesday. March 8th, 2023, at 7 o'clock p.m. in the lecture hall of the um, high school. Our regular school committee meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, March 29th, 2023, in the library of the Rainham Middle School. That concludes our regular school committee meeting. I will entertain a motion to adjourn on February 15th, 2023, um, school committee meeting at 8.40. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Marrera, second by Mrs. King. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful night. <laughs>